Hello everyone, I'm Greg Karlovitz from the Hydrologic Engineering Center. Welcome to our course on statistical methods in hydrology. This video is part three of four on the topic of extreme value theory, and we'll discuss the first extreme value theorem. Let's get started. Previously, we dealt with the variability of the cumulative probability for the sample maximum. Here, we will look at the variability in the value of the sample maximum. This table shows 10 samples, each of size 10, from some population. Each column is a sample. We see the sample maximum highlighted in red for each column. Then, we record the sample maximum value in the last row. What we are ultimately concerned with is the distribution of the values in that last row. I did say previously that this is straightforward for the sample minimum as well. If you transform these data by making each value negative and still using the sample maximum, the results still work. For example, in column 1, if you make each value negative, the sample maximum is negative 4. The sample minimum is 4. When we use non-overlapping groups of equal size to create our sample maxima, the procedure is called block maxima. In hydrology, we typically use the water year as our equal size non-overlapping groups. In the time series shown here, you can see that there are six water years corresponding to the six samples we are taking. The arrow labels the block maximum, which we also call the annual maximum. When the blocks we use for this kind of analysis are a year, we refer to the collection of the maxima we collect as an annual maximum series. You've seen this several times before, but this just reinforces exactly why the annual maximum series is used. When we go to build a model for these block maxima, we have to make some assumptions. First, we assume that all of the maxima are drawn from the same population with some distribution f of x. For annual maximum stream flow, f of x is the distribution of every day of flow in the year. Second, we assume that all of the maxima are taken independently of each other. This is why using blocks is important. If the blocks are large enough, the events are spaced out so that we can assume that they are independent of one another. This is why water years are divided at the driest part of the year, typically the fall in North America, and maximizes the separation in time between subsequent floods. When we meet these assumptions, we can estimate a model for the values of the sample maximum. The fischer tippett nedenko theorem gives us a model for these block maxima. The theorem states that when we meet the assumptions previously, the values of the sample maxima will have one of three probability distributions the Gumbel distribution, the Frechet distribution, or the Weibel distribution. These are also referred to as the extreme value type 1, type 2, and type 3 distributions. Fortunately, you don't have to remember or guess which of these three distributions your maxima will converge to. If you use the generalized extreme value distribution, it can represent all three of those extreme value distributions with a single function. This result is very similar to a more familiar theorem. The central limit theorem says that if we take repeated samples from a population and compute their mean, that the sample means converge to a normal distribution. The fischer tippett nedenko theorem, also called the first extreme value theorem, replaces the sample mean with a sample maximum and the normal distribution with the generalized extreme value distribution. I like to briefly explain where the names for these distributions come from. These three men were contemporaries, with most of their work coming in the first half of the 20th century. The distributions were not named for them until later. On the left is Gumbel, who we've seen previously. He was a German statistician and a political scientist who was staunchly anti-fascist and was driven from Germany in the years leading up to World War II. In the middle is Frisch, who is a Frenchman who seemed to contribute to every field of mathematics and is very well known. And on the right is Weibel a Swedish engineer who contributed greatly to the fields of reliability engineering and offshore oil exploration. The generalized extreme value, or GEV, distribution changes its shape according to its third parameter, kappa. This shape parameter allows it to become each of the three types of extreme value distribution. When it's exactly equal to zero, the GEV distribution becomes the Gumbel distribution. When it's negative, it becomes the Frechet distribution. The Weibel distribution results from a positive kappa. Sometimes, in literature, you'll see the opposite convention with a slightly different density function. The convention shown here instead is the convention used most frequently in precipitation frequency analysis. 
our sample maxima converge to the extreme value distributions at varying rates. How quickly and how close our samples get to the GEV distribution depend on three things. First, it depends on what the entire population that we get our maximum from looks like. Different parent population distributions result in the sample maxima converging to different EV distributions, that is, Gumbel, Crochet, or Weibel. Some of these parent populations converge more slowly than others. Second, the rate depends on how many events are in each block. Think of this as the number of chances we get to draw our maximum value. In a water year in a dry climate, there may only be a couple of significant flows during the year, so the number of events per block is small. In a humid climate, there may be many local maxima to draw our block maximum from. This is what is meant by events per block. Finally, our convergence depends on our sample size. If we only have a short record of block maxima, then the samples may not seem to have an extreme value distribution. However, the most important factor in convergence is that second point, how many events per year our maximum is drawn from. As this value gets larger and larger, the distribution of the values of our maxima look more and more like the GEV distribution. An important topic to consider is what is called the maximum domain of attraction. This describes the relationship between the distribution of our parent population and the distribution of block maxima taken from it. Looking at the parent population first can indicate how well your maxima are converging towards the GEV distribution. When the parent population is in the exponential family, for example, the normal, exponential, and gamma distributions, the maxima are in the Gumbel MDA and tend to have a GEV shape parameter very close to zero. Despite the modest tail weight of exponential family distributions, the convergence of maxima in the Gumbel MDA can be very slow. Heavy-tailed parent populations tend to fall into the Frechet MDA. We often find this is the case in precipitation frequency analyses. Light-tailed or upper-bounded populations tend to fall into the Weibel MDA. These kinds of parent populations tend to converge to the GEV distribution the fastest. This figure shows the effect of the number of events per block. The parent population, a standard normal distribution, is shown in black. If I take repeated samples of size 2 from this parent and keep the larger of those two observations, the distribution of that larger value looks like the red curve just to the right of the black one. If I repeat this exercise for the largest of a sample of 3, 5, 10, and so on, the curves move to the right and get progressively more peaked, culminating in the maximum of 1,000 samples in the orange curve to the right. This shows two interesting things. First, that the average value of the maxima grows with the number of events per year. This makes sense. The more chances you have to see a big value, the more likely that you'll get one. Second, we see that the variability actually decreases. The peak of the density is much taller as the number of events per block increases. Sometimes when you gather annual maximum data, the sample you get doesn't look like it has a GEV distribution. There are three primary factors that can delay the onset of convergence. First is that there are too few independent events per block. From the previous slide, we saw that the maximum of two or three values looks a lot like the parent population still. It takes more events for it to start looking like the GEV distribution. Second, when we have limited sample sizes, there is substantial uncertainty simply due to sample error. Third, and most often, is that the parent population is actually a mixture of several kinds of processes, so our samples are inhomogeneous. Another way to think about it is this. Imagine you live in a place where it rains once per year. If you take the maximum of that, nothing changes. The maximum of one value is the same as the population. If it rains twice, three times, and so on, then when you take the maxima, the resulting distribution looks more and more GEV-like. In the situations where you're modeling maxima in this way, and you find that the number of events per block that you have means that your data haven't quite converged to the GEV distribution, consider using the kappa distribution instead. In a technical paper I co-authored, we determined that the kappa distribution should be used to model these situations when an extreme value analysis is appropriate, but the number of events per block is too small. In hydrology, we work with annual maximum stream flow all the time. The annual maximum is the largest instantaneous flow out of 365 days of flow observations. However, not every day is a flood event. When we're interested in the largest flow in the year, it's because we want to know what big floods look like. 
This means that there may only be a few to maybe no events that we think of as floods for a given site. Analyzing stream flow also suffers from the fact that the records are mixed with flows caused by a variety of mechanisms, and they are serially correlated, meaning observations are related in time. This makes it hard to get independent and identically distributed samples. The bottom line is that Bulletin 17 procedures are built to deal with some of these issues in stream flow because the data do not always meet the assumptions we need for extreme value analysis. Log Pearson Type 3 can be an excellent model for daily stream flow. The fact that we are taking the annual maximum of only a handful of true events could be the reason that LP3 tends to be a good model for annual maximum stream flow, although theory suggests that the result should be GEV instead. The biggest challenge is that the mechanisms that create floods are a wide spectrum. Floods can depend on a long memory of highly variable meteorology. This indicates that the parent population of all floods is mixed, and any sample taken from it is inhomogeneous. This happens in almost any watershed, although rarely there can be one clear and dominant flood-causing mechanism. Some studies have been done to show how varying kinds of meteorology create floods, so that we can look at more homogeneous samples. This isn't typical practice in stream flow frequency analysis, however. These two plots show two different gauges. On the very left is a histogram of all floods for the gauge, with larger values towards the top. Filled in circles are annual maximum events, and open circles are other flood peaks. You can see an obvious positive skew to these data. Notable floods are shown as stars in each plot. For both of these systems, three kinds of storm event are shown, tropical storms, convectional storms, and frontal storms. The data show two things, how frequently those types of storm occur and how large the resulting floods tend to be. On the left, tropical floods are infrequent but severe. Frontal storms dominate the flood record, generating most of the floods at this site, including the 1993 flood of record. Convectional floods created a number of annual maxima, but are less common and less severe than the other types. The annual maxima are obviously mixed. On the right, there's a slightly different story. Tropical storms are a little more common, but still uncommon. The 1983 flood of record was a tropical storm. In this system, convectional systems are a little more common, but most are not annual maxima. Frontal storms are less common than convectional storms, but the second largest peak on record in 1993 is a frontal storm. You can see how treating the entire histogram as a homogeneous sample could be a mistake if you wanted to use an extreme value approach to this data. There's clearly a combination of mechanisms going on. In precipitation frequency analysis, it's becoming more common practice to try to isolate the mechanisms that create precipitation events. It still requires expertise in order to perform a storm type separation, but it can be simpler and more straightforward than in the stream flow case. Rainfall is much easier to analyze in a traditional extreme value theory manner, which is why precipitation frequency analysis tends to rely on it more than stream flow frequency. Plus, as we'll see in a coming topic, regionalization is easier for precipitation than for stream flow. In this video, we discuss the first extreme value theorem. Three key points to take away from this video are, the first extreme value theorem provides a model for the frequency magnitude relationship of block maxima. Annual maximum series tend to converge to the generalized extreme value or GEV distribution. And several issues with the data may prevent that sample's convergence to the GEV distribution. Thanks and tune into the next video in this series on extreme value theory to learn about the second extreme value theorem.